India, a country steeped in ritual, where spirituality is an integral part of life. Today, politically charged slogans serve a narrative in which nationalism and Hinduism rule supreme and where hate speech and violence towards non-Hindus are on the rise. A nation plagued by poverty and inequality. But with soaring ambitions, including the conquest of outer space. All this is India, 75 years after independence. A country often called the world's largest democracy, now home to almost 1.4 billion people. A pivotal figure in the birth of modern India was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, known as Mahatma, or Great Soul, a man whose campaign of non-violent resistance helped free the country in 1947 from British colonial rule. When Gandhi had to fight the cotton empire of British, he did not take out cannons. He pulled out a spinning wheel. And when he was asked, how do you think a few pieces of wood can bring you freedom? He said, it's the only thing that can, because anyone can make a spinning wheel. The poorest woman in the poorest hut can spin her freedom. So the spinning wheel became not just the symbol, but the methodology of getting freedom in the colonialism and globalization of that time. Gandhi saw the spinning wheel as a symbol of national identity and economic independence, a country where ordinary men and women would spin their own cloth. Vandana Shiva is one of Gandhi's most prominent intellectual heirs and a vocal critic of modern globalization. She continues the fight for his ideals of freedom, equality and non-violent change. Ideals that paved the way to India's independence on the 15th of August, 1947. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Gandhi was born in 1934. He's a grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and spent time with his grandfather as a child. The most important values, I think, would be uh, truth. He always insisted that truth is the, the uh, essence of life. We have to um, be able to speak the truth and and find the truth, pursue the truth. Along with political contemporaries such as Jawaharlal Nehru and B.R. Ambedkar, Gandhi envisioned an India in which everyone enjoyed equal rights, irrespective of religion. An India that would vanquish poverty and hunger. But what remains today of Gandhi's vision of freedom, equality and peaceful coexistence? Since Narendra Modi became Prime Minister in 2014, his right-wing Hindu Nationalist Party has been reshaping the country. The BJP actively champions Hinduism, instrumentalizing it for political gain. Recent years have seen a rise in hatred and incitement to violence towards non-Hindus, especially Muslims. Modi's government is an antithesis of Gandhi's philosophy. I mean, that's obvious. He didn't believe in Gandhi's philosophy. He has no respect for Gandhi at all. And, um, you know, he does everything possible to 
eliminate the image of Gandhi from India. Gandhi's sayings continue to provide inspiration the world over, but do his ideals still have meaning in the India of today? For millions of Indian men and women, poverty is a trap with no prospect of escape, thanks to the ancient caste system. It dates back some 3,000 years and divides people from birth in a social hierarchy of four castes, priests, warriors and rulers, merchants and laborers. One group are so low in the hierarchy that they're not even deemed worthy of a caste. Dalits have no other choice than to do the jobs nobody else wants, such as cleaning sewers and latrines by hand. I work for 30 to 50 rupees per month per house. Whatever little I get paid, I try to make do with that. I've been doing this for 50 or 60 years now. Dalits are seen as unclean and have long been deemed society's untouchables. They endure many hardships and discrimination and all too often violence. Bezwada Wilson is a crusader for the rights of Dalits. He also comes from a Dalit family and his parents and brothers worked collecting human waste. Today, Wilson leads a nationwide movement to eradicate what is known as manual scavenging. Constitution says that the people are all free and we are all equal and we do have a right to life with the dignity. But contrary to that, the practice of the manual scavenging, forcing the another human being to clean the human excreta, which is continuing. Namaste. Kaise? Please come in. Baito. Please Baito. take a seat. Dalits make up around 18% of India's population, more than 250 million people. As on today in India, there are almost 80 to 1 lakh 10,000 people are there cleaning the human excreta. Majority of them are women because it is being in an individual dry latrine cleaning. You started with your mother? Yes. You were about 10 years old? Yes, about 10 or 12. She would put a filled basket on my head for me to go off and empty it. In the monsoon. It was really hard work. Even if you have your face covered, the stench of someone else's excrement is difficult to bear. For all that work, they'd give me just one roti, one piece of bread, and they'd keep their distance handing it to me. So there are the people, they think that they are pure. There are somebody who are the pollute. They brand somebody as an pollute and such people are assigned to clean the polluted things. There is no one person exercising every day, you must do, you must do. But they made that as an institutionalized. Nobody questions. Nobody asks why it is happens. They say that there is no caste system in India now. Constitution says, Article 17, 
untouchability abolished but where it is abolished Sometimes Dalit men must climb down through the drains and into the sewer system with no protective gear. They won't allow this to be filmed since this kind of work is officially prohibited. We get called to people's houses because of blocked drains. First they move the foot mat and curtains aside. Our hands mustn't touch anything. Then we go inside and get to work. If we ask to pick something up, they say, no, 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 not that. And if we do touch it, they'll say, now you've ruined it. That's untouchability. You want to build your capacity and confident and you, however you want. They destroy. There is nothing untouchability means. They destroy the human, other human beings, confidence level and their dignity, self-respect into the break into the pieces like. And they will say the challenge that you come and compete with me. Careful with this one. Keep your distance. Did you clear it down to the bottom? Yes. And the other drain too? We didn't realize he'd inhaled the gas. It was only when he started choking. He died soon afterwards. Dalits have been killed cleaning sewers and septic tanks, usually due to toxic gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide. Government of India in 1993, first they have enacted to prohibit the manual scavenging in India. After 10 years we have seen. What happened that there is a law which prohibits? Why is the practice still continuing? In 2013, new legislation consolidated the ban on manual scavenging without protective equipment. The Modi government has introduced many social programs, such as the construction of toilets. But the discrimination and injustice faced by Dalits persists. It went to the Supreme Court. Long struggle, many hurdles. Never punished even a single person, all 11 years act after the act, amendment after the amendments for the law, but never punished even a single person. Papa started feeling unwell as soon as the gas hit him. The moment we opened the lid of the gutter, he got restless and started sweating. His whole body was drenched. He died while we were taking him to the hospital. He inhaled a lot of gas, really awful gas. The lid of the drain had been jammed for a long time. No one had any idea of what was down there. Everyone's out trying to earn a few rupees, but who knows what awaits them. In 2014, the Supreme Court has given a judgment. There they mentioned that, that the man should not, any human being should not enter into the manhole or the sewer line. And if something happens in accidentally in case of emergency, in such cases they have to provide 10 lakhs compensation like. <clears throat> then only we started counting how many people died in the country. So it was a, our really surprise that we got almost like a uh, 1600 and odd the deaths our people with the big yatra we collected. That we submitted to the government. But the deaths has not stopped. 
really in uh, last year in delhi itself we have uh, seen witnessed almost like a nine deaths within a one month and all nine deaths so we are saying that why can't the government make such machines and give it to them let them operate such machines and stop this killings in the sewer and gutters so that is the demand which we are taking forward across the country now my grandfather envisioned an india when everybody would be known as harijan so every hindu would be known as harijan uh, which is the word that he uh, described for the low caste untouchable people who were being oppressed he called them harijan which means children of god and he said the day everybody atones for the sins that they have committed in uh, in the caste system um, then all the hindus would have the right to be known as harijans and by doing that he was eliminating the whole caste system <laughs> In Beswada Wilson's eyes Mahatma Gandhi should have done more. Gandhi also said that my mother has cleaned my shit and scavenging women is also cleaning the shit. She is like my mother. If I have any chance of reborn at the next birth and I want to become a I want to born into the family of the scavenger. So you glorify the system. You say that until i come as in a next birth you people you continue do the scavenging so you glorify that and my mother did and you are doing never said that this is a wrong which is an inhuman which is obnoxious which is not accepted by any human society simple words mohandas karamchand gandhi never said apa chhoda se chhoda se every human life is equal all human rights are the same richness and poverty don't make you unequal in your humanity stand stand and pour the water I can't read or write. I don't want my child to be uneducated too. I want my child to move forward in life. I want to be known as the illiterate man who was able to get his child educated. While Gandhi held truth to be the highest virtue, the pursuit of truth is increasingly difficult in today's India. In 2022, the country's global press freedom ranking slipped to 150 out of 180 countries. 22-year-old Fahim is a reporter with the Mewat Community Radio. It takes a lot of courage to become a journalist here, especially as a woman in a patriarchal society. More than 40 journalists have been murdered in India since 2014, making it one of the most dangerous countries in the world for reporters. Who's she? She's from Radio Mewat. This morning, Fahin has come to meet a young woman we're calling Sajida. She didn't want her real name to be made public. Assalamu alaikum. A bit louder, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. 
Many of the women Fahin interviews have to remain anonymous for their own safety. My problem is, I've been married for three years. I was beaten up. Then I wasn't allowed back inside. I spent the whole night outside. They didn't let you in the house? Right. Then our matchmaker tried to intervene. They ignored him and wouldn't let me in. I was out there all night. Then what happened? In the morning, I called my mother. But what could she do? She thought I should just carry on living with my husband as daughters are meant to do. He beat me up a lot. No one protected me. After one and a half years, they said they'd only take me back with the dowry. It's about the dowry? Yes. How high a dowry? 500,000 rupees in a Ballora car. Only then would he take me back. He threatened to poison me. There are countless cases like Sajida's across India, many thousands of them, in both Hindu communities and in predominantly Muslim areas like here in Mewat. My daughter was married into a home where she isn't happy. It makes me desperate to know my child is so unhappy. I've been wronged. My children have been wronged. They broke my wife's hand and her leg. They broke an innocent child's hand too. Who did this? The in-laws. I'm truly desperate. Please don't cry. He divorced my daughter but doesn't pay alimony. Don't cry, uncle. What's happened has happened. It's a difficult situation. What can you do? Archana Kapoor launched the award-winning Mewat community radio station in 2010. It serves this local area 70 kilometers south of the Indian capital, New Delhi. In Mewat, every second house has a case of violence, domestic violence or sexual violence or any other kind of violence um, uh, registered or reported or somebody's daughter is sitting at home waiting for the husband or the in-laws to come and take the girl away. And when we started interacting in the village, we realized that this was a huge problem and nobody was talking about it. Even when we talked to the administration, they told us, you do programs on health and sanitation, but you know, domestic violence is not such a big issue. This is part of the culture. This is a patriarchal society. But then what about the rights of these girls? The job of the press is to report on stories of exploitation and suffering, people who are being denied their rights. If we keep giving the head of the village council a platform, we're following the same mindset, that only people with power can be heard. Then how can we give the powerless a voice? If we don't change the mindset, how will we change our fate? Because of the strict guidelines of community radios, we do not have the right to report on protest, we do not have the right to report on dissent, we do not have the right to talk about current affairs. If there is a rape in Mewat and there are plenty to report about, we cannot talk about it. So we have to go about uh, the whole incident in a very roundabout manner. So we talk about it, but then we talk about rights of a woman. We don't talk about the violation of the rights of a woman by somebody who was in power. It's an uncomfortable truth some prefer to avoid. India is a dangerous country for women and girls. Many victims of domestic violence are wary of going to the police out of fear of social stigma. It's hoped that more female police officers will foster greater trust. Do you want to press charges or have the village council decide? I'm going to press charges. 
We'll help you, unless you have any objections. No. The situation of women and girls here is such that if the village school only has classes through 8th grade, then the girls will only study through 8th grade. They won't be sent to any other village to continue their schooling. People here feel there's no point in a girl studying as she's only going to end up doing housework. And being able to run one household is more than enough. In my village, the school only went to eighth grade. I was too scared to go outside my village. And who would have dropped me off and picked me up? I was always scared of going anywhere by myself. And that's why I didn't continue my schooling. Journalists like Fahin and radio stations like Mewat take their message directly to their audience. For many women, it's the only way to learn about their rights. More than 30% of women in India are illiterate. How long have you been listening to the show? Two years. Two years? So what's the name of the program? It's about domestic violence. Domestic violence covers a lot of things. Financial abuse. Right. And what else? Psychological violence. Psychological violence, that's right. When we broadcast our show on domestic violence, there are male listeners too. And they accuse us of making their wives rebellious. If they realize that we're not allowed to beat them, they'll seek legal help. They don't let their wives listen to the program. They say, you're turning our wives against us, and now they're going to go to the police and file a complaint. They'll stop obeying us. Sakunat? Come over here. This is the script. What's it about? Pull up a chair. The program is called Hinsa Kono, or Say No to Violence. We've made 144 episodes in the three years since we started. Radio Mewat is on air for 17 hours a day, with broadcasts created and produced together by men and women. It's such a backward community and in, in such an obscurantist outlook they have that uh, they also told us that if a woman comes uh, on the radio and she's heard, then who will marry her? Because women are to be seen, not to be heard. And, uh, you know, if a woman goes into a village alone, then, you know, you don't know what will happen. A woman can't go to school. A woman can go and bring wood from the jungle. A woman can go and collect water from the well, which is far away. But a woman cannot go to school. A woman cannot speak on radio. A woman cannot do a program and a woman cannot go and speak to power. How many people in your village have had the COVID vaccine? A lot of people have had the shots. At first, we were reluctant because we were scared we might die from it. There were two kinds of vaccines, and people were afraid of them. How many women have been vaccinated? I think around 40 to 50 percent. And 80 percent of the men? Uh -huh. Yes. As coercive surveillance mechanisms will become the way of governing in the future, we will have to learn Gandhi's Satyagraha, the power of truth, the power of being truthful to yourself and free within yourself. His name is Sajidah. 
Her name is Sajida. This is the name we've given her because we can't reveal anyone's real name. So now we're going to hear Sajida tell us about how she was subjected to violence and then had to get divorced. As journalists, we should have complete freedom of speech because this is not just about one individual's voice, it's the people's voice, because not everyone can speak for themselves. When a journalist speaks, their voice is heard by over a million people. It wasn't just her husband who abused her. It was everyone else in the family, too. So what can the poor girl do? This is the question every girl who's been the victim of domestic violence faces. Don't be afraid, sisters. The law is on your side. You can find legal assistance to punish the person who was violent toward you. Preserving nature's creations and conserving resources was intrinsic to Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy, a message that is all the more important in light of the climate crisis for the planet and especially for India, where drought and heat have devastated entire regions. Just a century ago, the Bundelkhand region in central India was home to a tropical rainforest. We did have rainfall here, but the water would flow out of the drains and quickly dry up. So the groundwater levels were really low. The wells in the village would dry up, apart from one or two, which supplied drinking water to the entire village. If finding water to drink is so difficult, what's left to irrigate the crops? Climate change has seen temperatures in parts of India soar to 50 degrees Celsius. People are dying, crops are destroyed. The global food crisis unleashed in 2022 by the war in Ukraine has been exacerbated by the heat blighting India's harvests. The government has banned wheat exports. Grandfather's philosophy was violence against anything was wrong. Violence against nature and violence against environment uh, was just as bad as violence against human beings. That global violence against nature is having a tangible impact on the people of Bundelkhand. They depend on farming, and prolonged drought is a threat to their survival. After working the fields for four months, the villagers usually had to look for jobs elsewhere. How else could they feed their children when farming wasn't possible for so many months? The children would stay behind with one adult to take care of the household and the cattle. The rest of the family would migrate during the drought to find work, to Delhi or somewhere else. Now, 
If there's even less rainfall in the future, or too much, we need to collect the water. We have to build small-scale reservoirs and dams and soak pits. If we build soak pits above our farms, then water can be stored there. Today, no family here is forced to migrate for work, thanks to a relatively simple solution of reservoirs and the basins called soak pits. They're the most practical way to collect rainwater during the monsoon season. Zinat Niasi works for Development Alternatives, an NGO that uses smart water management to support village communities' efforts to cushion the impact of drought. A check dam is nothing but a small barrier that you are, uh, that you are constructing on the root of that water to slow it down, allow it to percolate in the ground and to uh, go into the aquifer, to recharge the aquifer. And when the aquifer gets recharged in the ground, the wells all around, you know, the water rises up there. So that's what we were seeing. And so at multiple places in the routes that we saw the water flowing, we would uh, break the speed of water and allow the water to recharge the ground. More than a hundred of these reservoirs have already been built in the region. Soon there should be four times as many. They're built and maintained by the village communities. Every villager had to contribute by either paying 2% of the cost or with their labor. So everyone had the chance to help. Those who didn't have the money donated their labor. The benefits are clear. These wells used to have water for at most two months a year. Now it's three months or more. Compared to five or ten years ago, what changes have you seen in farming? Ten years ago there was no water, so practically no profit from our harvest. Now the water level has risen and we've started making a profit. Farmers' profits have doubled and the training programs have helped. On the same acre of land, we now only need to sow 50 kilos of seeds and we end up with 1,700 kilos of produce. Half as much seed and 50% more yield? Yes. Instead of a single harvest, there are now three vegetable or wheat harvests a year. Good news in light of the global food crisis. Farmers here can grow enough to feed themselves and sell whatever's left over. And to make their farms even more sustainable, wastewater is treated so that it can be used to irrigate the fields. If a tap or a pipe is broken or the pump stops working, we might not have enough money. But if we save up enough together, we can call the plumber and get things repaired in time. So we collect a bit of money from everyone in the group. <laughs> Munibai, are you getting water? Yes, a lot. Everyone's getting water. <laughs> Enough to fill your tank? Yes, everything's all filled. But heat, drought and water shortages are not the only threats facing India's farmers. The monoculture of the militaristic mind assaulted our biodiversity, wiped out the forests and our waters, wiped out our food security, our soils, our water. 
Vandana Shiva's Navdanya movement is fighting the powerful transnational corporations that threaten the livelihoods of small independent farmers. She's one of the most prominent voices calling for the preservation of biodiversity and healthy soil and the protection of farmers' rights and for a ban on seed patents. Five companies control the food and health of the world and I took a decision to save seeds. I said, seed is not your property. You're going to dispossess peasants. You're going to force them to buy your seeds. You will push them into poverty and debt and suicide. Exactly what has happened. 400,000 Indian peasants have committed suicide since globalization and the taking control of the seed and the market. This is corporate slavery. In September 2019, India's high hopes were dashed. The Chandrayaan-2 mission's moon lander crashed onto the lunar surface. We came very close, but we will need to cover more ground in the times to come. Every Indian is filled with a spirit of pride as well as confidence. When it comes to our space program, the best is yet to come. The moon is just the beginning. India's aerospace program is an integral part of its geopolitical strategy in a future where geopolitical might will also be decided by the control of outer space. Like many other nations, India has set its sights on a new extraterrestrial gold rush asteroid mining. And power is also determined by control over the satellites used for global communications systems. Without them, modern life on Earth would come to a standstill. Shushmita Mohanty is one of the leading spaceship designers in India and the world. She also designs housing modules for long trips into outer space and spacesuits. I grew up in this confluence of space and science, technology and architecture and design. So I think my formative years, this kind of a dual influence got me interested in space architecture. There was no such discipline as space architecture then. It's an invented discipline. The idea that really I got smitten with in high school was how do I design things for living and working in microgravity, so in low Earth orbit. India's space journey started in the 60s and the initial focus of the Indian space program was to show how space technology can directly impact lives on Earth, how can we improve life on Earth. So one of the early experiments that Sarabhai did to demonstrate to the government that space can be a very powerful tool for development, in collaboration with NASA, he used a communication satellite and broadcast educational programs 
to thousands of villages across India. In 2013, India celebrated its successful Mars Orbiter mission to international acclaim, and it soon plans to launch its own astronauts into space in an Indian-built spacecraft. Scientist entrepreneurs like Shushmita Mohanty are at the forefront of innovation. Her work is top secret, since she consults for the Indian Space Research Organization, the ISRO, which is keen not to tip its hand. India is easily among the top five or six spacefaring nations in the world both in terms of technological capabilities and also budget. And we are one of seven countries in the world that have the rockets uh, that we need to launch the satellites. Bengaluru is India's aerospace startup capital. In 2020, a government decision gave the industry a massive boost, opening the market to more private sector companies another impetus for innovation alongside the ISRO. I'm good. Shushmita Mohanty also advises young entrepreneurs like Awais Ahmed of the space tech company Pixel. And uh, SpaceX launch will be with an aggregator or are you directly dealing with SpaceX? It's an aggregator, okay. but um, it's their ride share program. I think it'll be fun for you guys to be in, um, this will be in Florida, I guess. So the clean room checkout test and everything. Yeah. But, uh, you will be there for the launch itself. You'll be seeing the rocket go up. Yeah, I should be seeing it go up, yeah. I always tell people who are part of the space world, not part of the space world, to see a launch in real life. Mm. Because you know the, the, the sound boom that you hear when a rocket goes up? Yeah. Nothing quite like it. Pixel is a space data company. There's two critical words there, space and data. What we do is we build our own constellation of hyperspectral earth imaging satellites and the software tools that are required to take that imagery and extract useful insights out of that. The constellation of satellites is essentially satellites with cameras on them that take photographs of the earth. And hyperspectral means that they're able to capture data at a 50 times richer detail than any existing satellite that currently beaming down data from space. Hyperspectral cameras capture the full spectrum of light. The cameras look back at the Earth and capture a far broader range of colors than the human eye, including ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths. Particular features, crops or materials, each have their own spectral signature, which is displayed in a 3D cube. Until now, hyperspectral images have only been available to governments. Pixel now plans to offer its data to private sector customers, for example, in the agricultural industry, customers with deep pockets. With one capture of hyperspectral imagery from space, we're able to firstly identify, for example, the soil nutrients um, that are present and are lacking so that requisite fertilizers can be used. If there's nitrogen lacking, use a nitrogen fertilizer. If there's phosphorus lacking, use a phosphorus fertilizer. How do we use something for the betterment of humanity at a grassroots level? For our farmers, for our fisher folk, you know, saving people when it comes to cyclones or earthquakes. The whole Gandhian angle to how should technology make a difference to a nation and to human lives, we've been, we've been able to accomplish it quite well. I'm personally very critical of this space program. I think we are spending a lot of money on 
something that is not really very necessary right now. Uh, that money could have better be spent on eliminating poverty in the country, in the world. Gandhi written that you know, we are all citizens of the world in the end, no matter what nation we are from, and no matter what ethnicity, what religion you come from. We need to be able to work together and utilize the best of us as humanity to, to keep moving forward. Because without that, as a civilization or as a species, we are doomed. Official India is nowhere near Gandhi's values or, um, or beliefs. They pay a lot of respect to him, put his photographs everywhere and, and call him the father of the nation and so on, but they don't believe or follow his principles or his uh, philosophy. But at the grassroots level, I think he's still alive and still doing very well. Many young people have been inspired by him and they've continued to do some work to change society and bring about a change.